Thank you everyone for joining the US Asia Law Institute for our first speaker event of the new academic year. I am Catherine Wilhelm, Executive Director of the US Asia Law Institute, and I will be moderating today's program. Just a few preliminaries as more people join the room. First, this event is being recorded and we will be posting the video at our website at usali.org. And you can find recordings of many of our past events there as well. So today's speaker is Jim McGregor, an American author, journalist, and businessman who has worked in China for three decades. He is currently chairman of APCO Worldwide for Greater China, and he advises multinational companies on business, public policy, and communication strategies. Jim has written several books and industry reports that explain China's business model of what he calls authoritarian capitalism and how foreign companies must adapt and protect themselves to operate in China. I wanted to open our fall series with Jim because it seems incredibly important for us right now to get the US-China relationship right. And to do that, it's essential that we have an updated all around understanding of what is happening in the relationship. Not only is business an important piece of the overall relations, but right now it is probably the thickest piece. Working level exchanges between the two governments are significantly reduced and cooperation between civil society organizations is also much reduced from the level it was at just a few years ago. But last week, the American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai released the results of a survey it conducted of its members. And one of the striking results uh, or findings of their survey was that most member companies expect to maintain the current levels of investment in China. Fewer than 4% have plans to move production from China to the United States. And the overall FDI numbers, uh, foreign direct investment numbers, also support the conclusion that decoupling in business is not happening, at least not yet. So this is why we've asked uh, Jim McGregor to come speak to us. Uh, and now I'm going to turn it over to him. Jim, welcome to Usali. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I'd like to open up by saying how nice it is to be with Kathy Wilhelm. You know, Kathy and I go back 30 years. She was uh, with AP when I arrived in Beijing in 1990. I learned a lot about being a journalist in China from her. Then I watched her go to law school later in life. Uh, ended up at a, across a negotiating table with her in a deal after I'd become a consultant. I think it was a China law database uh, acquisition by Thomson Reuters. And later I uh, worked with her at the Ford Foundation. And I just want to, I'm just so happy to see you and to uh, be able to do this. Thank you, Kathy. Open up with a, a, a quote from Hank Paulson. Uh, in, in Singapore at the Bloomberg New Economy Forum a couple of years ago. You can't decouple if you're not a couple. Um, you know, if the U.S. wants to decouple from China, there's a lot of other countries out there and a lot of companies in those countries will be glad to take up the market share that Americans have in China. Just uh, what we're seeing in the last two days. Uh, as of two days ago, um, the the rule came into effect that the American companies could not sell their chips to Huawei. Um, they've applied for licenses to try to do so. We'll see what happens. Um, but the Japanese are already scrambling to fill that void. Um, that's just, you know, a real time example of the things that can happen. Um, you know, most companies, American companies, most companies are in China for China. I mean, uh, the U.S. Uh, China Security Review Commission uh, report recently pointed out that in 2017, 82% of what American companies produce in China is sold to Chinese customers in China. Um, and that they employ more people in China than anywhere else outside the United States. They've got about 1.7 million employees in China. Um, and it's the fourth largest destination of American R&D fund, funding in the world. Uh, let me go back to November, December, before, uh, before we got, uh, all got isolated by COVID talk about a couple of conversations I had in Beijing with retired um, cabinet level um, uh, Chinese officials. They were feeling very, very confident, saying things to me like, um, 
Uh, well, first off, um, the Chinese have gained a lot of confidence from what Huawei has done and how it's handling uh, its, its troubles with America. Um, the breaking of supply chains and production chains worry us the most. Um, the world is more dependent on China than China is dependent on the world. Um, you can't beat something with nothing. Um, and be careful if you um, energize your competitor to put a lot of money against trying to beat you. Um, and one thing they did say that really struck me is um, we expected this. Uh, we knew that our system uh, being so different that America would not be able to handle it once we got became big. Um, and uh, we're ready for this fight now. Uh, we're very confident. And um, uh, countries and companies are just going to have to decide uh, where they fit in with us. Very, very confident. I would say even a, even a bit arrogant. Um, but they're also, um, they were feeling, you know, under siege from America. So I think they wanted to push back hard. Um, the supply chain of uh, people moving out of China is, the, a lot of companies are moving things out, but it's toys, textiles, components, uh, simple electronics. These companies have been ready to leave China for a number of years because China got quite expensive. Um, and, and, but the supply chains were good. The logistics on shipping out were very good. So they were eating margin to stay in China. So when Trump's tariffs came in, that was a straw that broke the camel's back. A lot of them are moving to Vietnam, India, whatever. You know, as Kathy said from the AmCham survey, they're certainly not moving to the U.S. Um, and only, only about 30% of them are doing any moving, but that is just to be basically to diversify their manufacturing base because many of them had too much in China, they had all their eggs in the China basket. Um, the, other, the other side of it is um, in China for China. Um, the companies I work with are doubling down on China the, the, because the top tech companies in the United States have the best market share in China because China can't do many things they're doing now. And so um, they want to be deeper into China. They're moving more of their supply chain into China because they don't want to be crossing borders and, and dealing with tariffs and other, and other problems. Um, and, and China, um, you know, upgrading with Made in China 2025, with, with pushing on robotics, AI, self-driving cars, um, um, uh, artificial intelligence, on and on and on. Um, they believe that China's going to be the market lead in the future for those, for those products. They've got to be there if they want to compete. And you've got to be there in a big way. Uh, at the same time, uh, there's uh, 80, 80, 800 million people more in China to meet the middle class. It's looked at as the market uh, that's going to continue to grow. Um, and um, so they're looking at China plus one. They're looking at reshoring, not reshoring, but multi-shoring going in, in many places. Um, so it's very complicated. I mean, just look at it. Foxconn alone that makes iPhones and all this has 1,500 suppliers in China. Try moving that supply chain. Um, the, uh, this has now become a board level priority because it was all about the Japanese, what we learned from the Japanese on just in time manufacturing, on um, you know, lowest cost and um, you know, comparative advantage. And now they're gonna have to invest money in redundancies because they've seen what happens with tariffs and COVID and um, you know, being too much stuck in one place and not being able to move around the world. Um, one thing that we have lost um, by, all, by offshoring so much of our manufacturing, we went from um, design, manufacturing, and sales to design and sales. And mm -hmm. so when you get that far away from your customer, um, you often lose the, the edge on your own design. So that was a, a, you know, a, a big mistake in the United States. And even the Pentagon, they got very worried about the, its supply chain did a study a couple of years ago. And um, they found that so much of their supply chain was from China, they kept the number um, uh, classified on how, how, how large it was. Uh, but they were the ones that really pushed out this design, uh, manufacturing and sales and losing that manufacturing is really damaging for your ability uh, to innovate and design. So how's China dealing with this? Um, China's never been nicer to foreign companies. Um, I was talking to a friend in uh, Shanghai the other day, uh, an American company. The mayor of Qingdao came to Shanghai to meet him to talk about expanding in Qingdao. Um, China's feeling vulnerable. They don't want foreign companies to leave. 
So they have a charm offensive going on, a much better charm offensive than they're doing with their wolf warrior diplomats, actually. Um, and they're and because they want company companies to stay. And now um, Xi Jinping has this new um, development model. He calls it that he announced a couple of weeks ago, ago called dual circulation. What is dual? Uh, you got to pay attention to this because it's it's the follow on to supply side restructuring four years ago. And what it's about is they are looking at a, a world of long term hostility. And so they are now looking at, we do not want to be dependent on, on, on offshore demand uh, for our economy. We also want our ties with the world to be beneficial for us. So they have, they're stepping back and they're looking at all their, how they're intertwined with the world. And they're looking at the world and they're looking at China, kind of a traditional view, actually. And they're looking at how do they optimize this for their own advantage. So part of that is they're gonna be working more and more to be less dependent on exports. And already the Chinese economy is a lot less dependent on exports than it was in the past. They've diversified a lot. It's gonna be more and more about their domestic market, building on, you know, what did Xi Jinping call it? Our, our, our great domestic market, you know, that um, domestic demand will drive the economy, but also having their own um, technology at home. So this is going to be good for foreign companies who can help China. If you are in technology that China um, needs and wants, if you are in a business that China considers important for their growing their economy, and whether that is a, a big box retailer that can produce, that can sell low cost goods uh, to Chinese consumers and help build the consumer economy, or it's people in the chip business or, or specialty chemicals or manufacturing of, of some sort, um, China's going to be opening up more and more, and they're welcoming foreign business. My warning to foreign business is you better go in with both guys open because China has not changed its desire to learn what you do and replace you. That has been the game from day one. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we've, we've learned about this. Um, I look at U.S. China as um, uh, overreach versus underperformance. China has overreached. China had a good thing going with the United States. Um, they uh, you could even hack American technology from a company, many companies, and they would go to USTR or commerce and they would say, I'm very unhappy. Look at what's happened with this hacking of our technology. And then the U.S. government would say, what should we do? And the company would go, oh, please don't do anything. Don't mess up my, my China market share. Well, um, China overreached with Made in China 2025. It was it, it went too far. Um, and uh, over the last five, six, seven years, you know, I've, I've been with AmCham for many years. AmCham chairman in '96. I was with the groups lobbying for uh, MFN and WTO reasonable policies on China. You know, the last many numbers of years, we've been going to the U.S. government saying you got to do something. You know, they were ready for a pushback because China started doing reform and closing, opening uh, more and more reforming for its local companies and closing for foreign companies where they could be replaced by, by Chinese companies. Um, so uh, let me just, I'll, I'll do a little editorializing. Um, uh, trying to decouple from China and block China is a losing game. It, it will not happen. Um, you know, uh, well, well, the U.S. is talking about, um, you know, putting uh, money towards uh, American companies, bringing their supply chains back. Um, uh, 3.7 percent of Shanghai uh, uh, American companies responded that they're moving, planning on moving anything to the United States. Um, you know, if, uh, uh, you know, we, 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 we messed up in that we got too enthralled in the Reagan era and on about um, you know free markets solve all problems. We can invest it. We quit investing in our science and technology, in education, um, in in, uh, in 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 attracting and keeping talent, um, and that is uh, you know that has been a problem. So a lot of this is our own goal. I mean, I did a study on technology in in the U.S. and China back in 2010. Two thirds of, of, of the money that went into um, R&D um, after World War II all the way up into the 70s was from the government. 
and it was it was companies working with acad academia and the government. And I've had uh, companies in Silicon Valley tell me they have to take Chinese money because they cannot get um, uh, uh, American venture capital because return isn't quick enough. So we've got a lot of things we've got to fix on our own. If China has a thousand talent program, why don't we have a 10,000 talent program? Why don't we staple a green card to every foreigner who gets a, a PhD in the hard sciences in America instead of um, um, you know, trying, to, trying to send them home? Um, good news is um, that is starting to happen actually. Um, uh, in Congress, Cruz, Rubio, Hawley, these conservative Republicans are coming up with industrial policies that look like made in China 2025. Cornyn from Texas. It's about putting $50 billion into um, chip development in the U.S. and, 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 and um, you know, getting a tighter grip on keeping that technology at home. Uh, uh, Schumer has something called the Endless Frontiers Act that looks like Made in America 2025. Um, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of these bills. There's also a lot of nonsense bills in Congress. But, um, and also if you look at what Biden is, is pushing, um, it, it's, it's similar policies on investing in the United States. And I would guess that even if Trump get reelected, he's gonna be turning back somewhat in that direction because he doesn't really care about much but the stock market and the trade deficit. Um, and if he gets reelected, um, I think he's gonna be looking at how to do more business with China. Um, now, uh, against that, you have Pompeo, um, in, in Navarro and Lighthizer and others in the administration who are out to punish China uh, and take very, very hard line views. Um, you know, how will that play out? Because the Republicans actually, um, one of the reasons I think Rubio Cruz and, and, and some of these others are being so hard line on China is they're looking to replace Trump as the standard bearer for the conservative side of the Republican party with China as their foil. So, um, and yeah, there's there's a lot of things that are um, that are that are unknown right now, um, but uh, I think the U.S. is now waking up to competing with China, um, and uh, and China is going to have to kind of wake up to uh, um, um, getting over our zero sum game. That uh, you know, China talks win win, but so often that's China wins twice. I'll end with that note. Thank you, Jim. That was a amazing. Uh, toward a horizon. You just took us in uh, a very few minutes through a huge number of very complicated issues um, to sort of help us to start to unpick this apparently simplistic idea of just decoupling. I mean, the word itself um, contains so many different concepts. Um, so as you've identified, there's decoupling for American companies that are in China for China, and uh, you've just made the case that that doesn't make sense if you're manufacturing in China because you want to sell to the Chinese market, you're not likely to leave. And then there's decoupling for those companies that are in China because of supply chains that are going back to the US or to somewhere else in the world, which possibly is a different set of, um, a different kind of a calculus. Um, you've touched on what the Chinese government is doing to keep some companies, foreign companies, U.S. companies there, if they think it will meet their uh, policy goals and their objectives, but always with uh, China's own development goals in mind, not, not really, as you say, win-win. Uh, um, a really important theme that I, I, I was kind of hearing as a subtext and occasionally text of what you just said is this question of, of uh, industrial policy this question of what is the relationship between uh, government and business uh, and, and who gets to decide, right? Is it up to business to decide to stay or to go, or is it up to government? And as you say, since Reagan, certainly the emphasis has been on businesses following profits. Uh, we have had less government investment in R&D, less government investment in infrastructure to support business uh, or uh, manufacturing and all, and uh, companies have gone out. The cumulative effect of the decisions that companies have made has had this huge impact on the United States. Uh, loss of jobs, hollowing out of communities, uh, displacement of, uh, of, of, of uh, technology. 
So you say Cruz and some of the others uh, on the Republican side now in Congress are willing to support government investment in R&D, but what about the business community? Where is their head at when it comes to rethinking the relationship between business and government? In other words, does business see the role of government to support what they want to do? Is business, if business wants R&D money from government, is, it, is business willing to give up some autonomy in deciding where it goes? Are businesses willing to say, okay, uh, if government supports us being in the United States, we promise we undertake to re reshore a certain number of jobs? Does business see any role for local communities in deciding where they manufacture? Is there any, is there any willingness to shift away from that Milton Friedman, Reaganite thinking about uh, business doing what's best for business and particularly the returns to the, the short-term returns to the shareholder? Yeah, you know, the, um, well, uh, that, that, I, that's a lot to unpack. Um, let me start out with um, uh, American business many American businesses have been untethered from America by globalization because the way our system works, their job is to make money. Their job is to, for shareholders. Um, and that's it. And um, if your market outside of America is bigger than America, um, then um, you know, for some of these companies by a pure economic sense, Xi Jinping is more important to them than Trump. And then those are the incentives uh, they're going by. I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but that's where we've ended up. When America was the largest market for these companies, um, the American government had a lot more say. Mm -hmm. We also have to look at our own history. Um, you know, it's a fiction that, that uh, free markets built where America is. 1791, Alexander Hamilton put in industrial policies and, and protectionism that lasted for 150 years. The same thing the Brits had done. America's um, um, uh, real strength came after World War II. Why? Because we had the War Production Board during World War II run by a Sears executive where all the companies came together with the government and figured out how they go from making one plane a week to 10,000 a week and how to put women in factories and men in the field and on and on and on. And after the war, because America was in one place, it wasn't really hit hard by any, any kind of um, battle on our territory, um, we turned all those industries into uh, consumer goods and, and, uh, and uh, industrial goods, and uh, we, we, we built our economy into the, the prowess that we had. So we got to get over the fiction that it wasn't industrial policies that got, where, got us where we are. Um, companies are pretty patriotic. I deal with a lot of CEOs. Um, they feel very torn because, you know, they have to do business and they know if they're not in China, they're going to lose out to the Japanese or the Koreans or the Germans or whomever. Um, and, but they, they do want to do what's right for America. But it's going to take we have to we, we really need American business and government to come together and, and, and sort this out, because in addition to not investing in in technology and and, um, and infrastructure, we didn't invest in people. Uh, we gave up apprenticeship programs. We had very strong apprenticeship programs after World War II. Uh, we, you know, we gave up. We we gave up on retraining workers. Um, and we and, and we look what the Germans did compared to us. How they held on to their manufacturing and moved into high end manufacturing. We let it all go. And part of this was China was so damn efficient. You know, jobs were always leaving to go to Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, Thailand, you know, the, the Asian tigers over the years because of cost differences. When China got in the game, it was a giant sucking sound. Why? Because China, when China does something, they do it big. And they were so efficient at it. Um, I mean, look, 80s, early 90s in China, what was China doing? They were building villas and golf courses so that the foreign companies would be comfortable when they got there. They were building international schools. They weren't just building industrial parks. They weren't just building ports for shipping. You know, they, they, you know when China does something, they do it, they do it pretty a bang up job. And so the, 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 the jobs just rushed out of, um, uh, you know, a, a certain number of American communities that, that, were that were devastated by it. And that, 
that's that's not China's problem. That's our problem, on that's a government problem um, for letting that happen and not not um, you know one of the things you can say about China, they never forget about jobs. Um, mm-hmm. You know, in the, the Chinese government runs scared of its own people. I mean, you get in the way of the party, you're, you're, you're finished. But they pick themselves, so it's a pretty performance-oriented government. And so they never forget about jobs. You remember the global financial crisis, Asia financial crisis, Chinese officials going to companies saying, you can't lay anybody off. Um, America, America forgot about La Bai Xing. We forgot about jobs. We forgot about uh, working people. And now to try to bring supply chains back to America, we do not have the, we don't have the trained task force. We don't have the workforce. We don't have the managers of factories. I was in uh, Shenzhen with the, um, the uh, CEO of uh, TCL, the big uh, electronics company. And we were visiting, his, this is two years ago, visiting his new facility that if you walked around the perimeter of the building alone, it was six kilometers. And it had, um, uh, it was all robotics in there. And I said, these, you know, Trump's chairs were just starting. And I said, are you going to, would you move some manufacturing to America uh, because of these tariffs? He said, how could I do that? You don't have the workforce. You don't have the managers. I'll just expand in Mexico. And that's where we are. So we've got to rethink what we do. And you're not going to, I mean, you're going to bring a, a bunch of existing supply chains back. That's, you know, that's, that's, that's simple. Um, uh, un, that's uninformed thinking. Uh, that it, the world doesn't work that way. We've got to rebuild uh, for the future. So let me pick up on what you said a few minutes ago was Germany never experienced quite the same job loss or the manufacturing loss that the United States has. What did Germany do that was different that the United States hasn't done in terms of keeping its companies from moving to China or incentivizing them to stay at home? And is there a, a solution or some seeds of a solution in there for what a if the U.S. government it continues to push for decoupling and for bringing things home for reshoring for what that might look like if it were a smart decoupling policy? In other words, you've made the case that de- just decoupling by fiat isn't going to be successful. What would a smart decoupling policy look like? And can we learn from Germany or is there some other model that we can learn from for how to achieve that? Well, what Germany did is um, they kind of did what we, what we used to do. They have very strong apprenticeship programs. They've got very strong technical training programs and they invested in moving up, the, moving up in their manufacturing chain. Um, you know, they, they uh, as you let jobs go offshore, they, they they built the next the next phase well the next phase of of manufacturing where did China get um, uh, made in China 2025 they got it from uh, uh, Germany uh, uh, what was it called um, in, industry 2.0 or something uh, they 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 studied the German model on how they uh, upgraded their manufacturing how they they went to higher tech they went to more robotics they went to more technical training and technical people, uh, um, you know, uh, working instead of just low cost labor or a uh, basic labor. Um, and, and the government supported it. Mm. What would need to happen here in the U S for us to move in the direction of developing that kind of a smart decoupling policy? We probably would need a functioning, um, political system. That would be helpful. You know, we, uh, um, you know, uh, you know, when I sit in China and I watch the Chinese government, there's a lot of things not to like, but um, the hardworking and efficiency and the government. Look, you know, the Communist Party in, in, in many ways in, on a local level is like a superannuated chamber of commerce. You know, if you're running a company in Wuhan or Qingdao or something, the party secretary will come and have, bring his team over and have lunch with you once or twice a year and say, what do you need? What do you need for infrastructure? What do you need for training? Um, you know, how can we push your business? Um, it'd be nice if, um, if, 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 if we engage in some of that. You know, I've been back in America for a year now, uh, well, since January because of COVID. Um, we're yelling at each other on cable TV. Uh, you know, we, we have to fix ourselves in, in the way we, the basic functions of our government so that we're, we're looking ahead, we're planning ahead, we're working together on what, what is good. I, mean, I don't want to turn this into a political argument, but actually that's what it is. Uh, we, you know, this is this is us getting our act together and competing. You know, we 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 have to compete. Um, 
and nothing's going to happen by magic. It's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be hard work and it's going to take time and it's going to take effort and it's going to take uh, industry and government working together. And I can tell you, um, industry is very willing to work with a smart government. Um, you know, somebody that is, wants to work with them. Um, and some of these bills are that way. For example, Mark Warner um, and others, you know, Mark Warner is a former, one of the founders of Nextel. He knows technology. Um, he has a bill on open RAN, which is um, um, building software because of, you know, we're worried about Huawei and their 5G uh, and all of their equipment being around the world. This is about laying software into those pipes to take away any advantage somebody um, who, who has them, who put in the machinery would have. Um, and, and, you know, I, I won't get, I, I, I not only won't get too technical, I'm not technical enough to, to say it directly, but I've talked to software CEOs in the Silicon Valley who are very excited about this, but it's going to take government money to incentivize to do it, but it could, it could solve a problem and America's strength is software. The things like that. There's a lot of stuff out there. What's funny in America, if you, if you go to Washington, you see these think tanks and people like the Gates Foundation doing all these incredible studies of what we should do. I mean, we're very good at what we should do. We should try doing some of it. Mm. Let me switch uh, a little bit focus because you, you mentioned that you're not actually in China right now. Um, you're, you're in the United States and have been sort of uh, marooned here. Uh, since January because of COVID. Um, now, how many, roughly, how many of your fellow businessmen who were normally based in China are in the same situation? I know that when, when COVID initially hit uh, China hard, they um, imposed a lot of restrictions on movement, including on people coming in. And they now have uh, begun to open up their borders to selected countries where there is not a high uh, prevalence of the disease. People come in, still need to be quarantined. My understanding is that Americans are still not allowed as a, as a group, but that there are initiatives to bring uh, and efforts by AmCham and some other uh, private channel efforts to bring in groups of businessmen. Uh, how is that going and how, how much of the American business community is actually stranded in the U.S. as you are right now by the uh, COVID restrictions? Uh, um, a huge number of people are like me because yeah. it also coincided with Chinese New Year's. So a lot of them left China with their families for Chinese New Year's and all of a sudden when, with the COVID breakout, they stayed away because of COVID and now with the closed border, they can't get back. If I wanted to go back to China right now, I would have to get the Shanghai government um, to um, uh, basically write a letter, a permit that I was an essential executive. And then I'd have to go through a whole bunch of stuff with a, a COVID test here, um, uh, uh, certifications within, uh, I think, a couple of days by, uh, by a Chinese consulate or embassy. I'd have to get an airplane ticket, which is impossible. Um, I think there's four flights a week per airline. Um, last I heard, business class was twenty-five thousand, and uh, economy was nine thousand dollars one way. Um, one way. Yes. And, and then I would arrive in China, and I would um, 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 get tested, and then I would be two weeks quarantine in a government facility. Usually, in fact, I was on WeChat this morning with a friend of mine who's was having a, a hard-boiled egg and a, a manto in a. In a, in, a, in a Chinese dormitory building uh, on this 14-day quarantine. Um, AmCham just um, um, flew one plane load over. It was an enormous lift to do it. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, in America, with our COVID being out of control, we're not high on the list on people they want to they, they wanna welcome back. And so what's happening, Kathy, actually, um, a lot of people are giving up on China. Uh, a number, you know, these executives, I'm, I'm older, so my kids are grown. A lot of them have kids and they've been stuck over here. They've, they've got their kids enrolled in school and they're saying, hell with it, I'm going um, to stay in the U.S. Some of them are running their companies from the U.S. Others are leaving their companies and, and changing to a domestic job. Um, the international so, schools are, are hurting now. So just to be clear, when you say they're giving up in China, you mean that individually the executives are giving up on going back to work in China, their companies are not. Yes, yeah, it's the individuals. So what effect does this have on those businesses for their leadership to be 
in, in long-term exile like this. I would imagine that there are real effects over time um, in, uh, in how well that company can perform. Well, actually, um, yes and no. Um, because also many of the American companies or foreign companies in China are now run by Chinese nationals. You know, there's been a lot of uh, localization over the years and people that have been, you know, there's some incredible people have been working for these companies for 10, 15, 20 years, or they were in America and they went back to China because their parents are getting old. And also they kind of reached a, I don't know what you would call it, a glass ceiling in the U S on how far they could go up. And so they went back to China. So uh, between that and people working on zoom and, um, and the ones that are running big multinationals in China, they're the ones that are eating manto and, and boiled eggs right now in a, in a, uh, uh, in a facility. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're getting themselves back. Well, I'm going to start in a few minutes. I'm going to start um, taking some of the questions that I see popping up in the, in the uh, question panel. But just there's one other aspect of this uh, very complicated set of issues here that I wanted to touch on, and that is um, the, the, the difficulty that U.S. companies may be facing right now in responding to conflicting uh, legal instructions and conflicting rules and also policy preferences coming at them from the two different governments, from the U.S. and Chinese governments. And how are companies trying to respond to that? Uh, one recent example, of course, that's been talked about quite a bit is HSBC. It has been accused by the Chinese government very prominently of cooperating with the U.S. government investigation of Huawei. And so they uh, seem to be facing potential for retaliation in China for that. Uh, but more recently in its uh, actions, the executive orders and the State Department and Treasury rules against, uh, with respond to uh, the Hong Kong national security legislation, the U.S. government is ordering financial institutions, including American banks, but all banks that, that, that use, that uh, operate using the U.S. currency uh, to take certain actions uh, via the, to not transact with certain Chinese and Hong Kong officials and certain Chinese and Hong Kong companies. But the financial institutions are concerned if they obey the U.S. instructions that they are open to a charge under the Hong Kong national security law of uh, colluding with foreign powers to undermine uh, Chinese national security. So these kinds of dilemmas um, seem to be getting uh, more and more prominent. How do you see companies responding to these? Do they have, have they worked out protocols? Are they going to have to set up uh, some kind of firewalls? Are they going to need to restructure themselves in some way so that they have different, you know, entities or different boards that are responding to the two different governments? What, what, what might that look like? They are trying to figure this out in real time. And there really is no answer um, other than um, trying to talk to both governments, fasten your seatbelt and keep your head down. Um, and also you're finding that, you know, like this is getting now to the board level and boards are uh, pretty much, they very much worry about risk. And so boards are saying, oh my God, China's dangerous. Um, we've got to, you know, we've got to, should we be there? Um, you know, how do we mitigate? Meanwhile, their head of their business in China is saying, we have more opportunity here than ever before. Don't run away from what we have going. Um, as usual with Chinese law, the, uh, the, uh, the law is very vague. It, you, know, you, can, you can interpret it many ways, but the penalties are specific. Um, and so it's, you know, the, this national security law, the, the, um, the international reach of that is actually unprecedented. It's more than, than, than in Chinese domestic law. Um, so they're very concerned. And, you know, remember when the, the U.S. started, um, uh, you know, putting companies on the entity list, un entity list then, um, or blocking, you know, for example, if a chip company is now complying with the U.S. on not selling chips into China or to Huawei, 
then China dangled this thing called the unreliable entity list. Mm -hmm. That if, Well, then we're going to have an unreliable entity list. And if you do that, if you follow what your government says, we're going to get at, we're going to get you in China. They haven't done that yet. Um, mm -hmm. That's, you know, it's, it's all these threats on both sides um, that have people very uncomfortable. And, you know, this goes in a milder way. It goes back to when they had the airlines and the hotels and they were beating them up for the way they listed Taiwan on their sites. Um, or even during the Hong Kong demonstrations, if you have people in your company who are work, you know, are, who are demonstrators, as most young people were, um, you know, how do you deal with it? It's a, um, it's not easy to be a CEO in, in the, anywhere in the world today. And, and is it possible to describe briefly how most American companies did deal with that with respect to the Hong Kong protesters, for example? Is there a a, a kind of a, a solution that many of them turned to, or was it just very ad hoc across the board responses? Well, actually, it was pretty ad hoc. What happened was there was times where there was um, uh, foreign companies and uh, the Chinese security came in and said, you've got these people um, uh, involved in the demonstration. Um, you've got to do something about this. Uh, meanwhile, these companies have uh, a workforce that was very much behind the demonstrations. At least, you know, it was it was, it was by ages, really. The younger people supported it more. Um, and they were making threats on these companies' ability to do business in China if they didn't take care of it. And then one day it all stopped. Because I think what happened is it moved up to a high level in China, away from just the security guys. And they thought about it. They said, oh, wait a second. Do we really want to, uh, you know, blow up these, uh, these companies doing business in China um, and, and scare them away? Uh, you know, at this point, that would not be a smart thing to do. But by putting that hint out there, and now the national security law is kind of a, a lingering cloud um, ab above people. And uh, I think people are very careful in what they say. Um, um, and, you know, and, you know, with, especially with things like Xinjiang, you know, the, the, um, you know, what do you do? You know, if you got, if, it, if that's going on in China um, and, and then the U S is pushing back on that um, you've got a lot of business in China. Um, you depend on that business for being able to, compete globally. Everybody's in a very difficult fix these days. A very this, difficult. Is, this is not new, Jim, because you'll recall after 1989 in China, companies faced similar kinds of pressure when um, after the dust settled from that military uh, action in, in central Beijing and, and, and cracked down in other places as well. Uh, local authorities started visiting companies and requiring them to do investigations of which of their staff had participated in demonstrations. And that was, and foreign companies were among them. Now, of course, there were far fewer foreign companies then. But even then, we did see instances of foreign companies letting go employees because they had been identified as playing a role in the demonstrations. And there was a little bit of a shock over that because I think maybe we were naive, but we thought that American companies uh, were going to be behave by a different set of rules. They were going to follow a higher minded playbook, perhaps. And the companies themselves had always said, if we invest in China, um, we are bringing a higher standard of business operations. We are bringing American values. We are going to be operating differently from Chinese companies. And we saw at that time that that wasn't necessarily the case. So in, in Hong Kong, um, you know, I guess what I'm saying is there was some precedent for this. It wouldn't be a new challenge for companies. They should have been prepared. Um, in Hong Kong, were there American companies laying off young employees because they had been uh, in, in the protests that, not, you're, that you're aware of? Not that I'm aware of, but it, I, I won't say it didn't happen. I just am, I am not aware of that. Um, you know, the... the, the, the in defense of, of American companies a bit, um, American companies within their businesses in China operate in a very, um, um, in, a, in a very American way. You know, uh, uh, Chinese employees have liked working for American companies and foreign companies because there's a real meritocracy, there's a fairness um, uh, in, in the way you do business and the way you treat your employees. Um, and also these companies have spent a lot of money in training employees and sending them around the world and 
um, uh, you know, helping them with education. There's been a lot of good things done, but boy, when you get stuck between the two governments, um, you know, as, uh, as uh, Kissinger said, you know, the, uh, the DNA of our, the two political system is very, are, is very different and there's no way to fix that. And these companies are, are, are stuck in it. Um, it's not, it's, it, and now that China has overreached and, and, and gotten very aggressive around the world and done, um, uh, you know, stronger and stronger in, um, um, in its controls in China and the way it treats some of its people, um, it's very, it's very difficult to, um, you know, the, it, it, it's even tougher, but the market there matters more to them. So are you a bunch of Philistines for doing that? Well, I'm sorry, they're doing global business in a, in a country that um, is heading in a direction that is making a lot of companies uncomfortable despite the, the, the business they have to do there. But you notice just the, the last two days, um, the Europeans have had a, 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 um, a, a virtual summit with Xi Jinping and Europeans were pushing very hard on human rights in Xinjiang and, and um, Xi Jinping went right back after him on human rights in Europe and, and uh, discrimination against Jewish people and this and that. So China's, um, you know, China's got, um, China's uh, taking a very aggressive stance. Hmm. Joe, I'm gonna start taking some of the questions that have been submitted and uh, I welcome more. So the first one, um, how are Microsoft, Apple, Intel, Cisco, and the other major US tech companies going to handle likely accusations that they are supporting the Great Firewall and Xi Jinping's overall authoritarian rule? Well, um, actually, uh, uh, foreign companies built the Great Firewall. You know, a lot of the technology for the Great Firewall was sold to um, you know, Chinese actors who put it together. Now, I don't, these companies didn't build it, but their equipment and software and others were, were, were the tools that, that China used. Um, the, uh, I, uh, well, here, I'll, let me take a different angle on this. Um, China came up with the concept of cyber sovereignty, um, that um, the borders of a country and the borders of a country's internet are sovereign. And we all looked at China like they were crazy because the internet is everywhere and you can't, you can't control it. Well, um, it looks like America is now uh, developing a bit of cyber sovereignty ourselves with, uh, with TikTok and WeChat um, and um, uh, Secretary Pompeo's Five Cleans initiative. Uh, meanwhile, China has been going out around the world and, and you know, with Russia and other uh, countries and helping them build their own firewalls. So um, it's, a, it's, a it's a complicated picture. But again, on, on these companies, um, are these companies, I think they're now being much more careful on who they sell to and how they sell. Um, this entity list actually on um, companies involved in Xinjiang, companies involved in building the bases on the South China Sea and others um, uh, uh, have people once again uh, going through their supply chains very carefully as they did when it was worries about prison labor and child labor. Um, so I have to say these entity lists um, being more than formulaic are somewhat um, are having some effect. But how can the entity lists address, fully address the problem when these major US tech companies actually have massive campuses in China for R&D, for development of new products, as well as for manufacturing. I mean, it's not just a question of these companies making goods that they then sell to Chinese companies, in which case you can kind of police your own customer list and say, all right, we're not selling to Huawei, we're not selling to known subsidiaries of Huawei. That's a pretty clean kind of decision-making process and you can excise those companies that you think are bad actors or that are on the entity list. But if U.S. companies are in China in the, in the major way that they are, with massive campuses, large numbers of employees, multiple R&D sections, developing new technology specifically for the Chinese market, how do you, how does, how, how does the entity list constrain them in any meaningful way? Yeah, fair enough. No, what the entity list does is it um, 
it it goes after Chinese suppliers who are um, you know complicit in some of these things. That's you know, you're right. It's a it's a not a side issue, but it's just a piece of it. I mean, the you know, the way the world is shaped, China's the market, and it's the market now, and it's the market of the future. If our companies are not there, then America America is going to become a, a um, and also ran. It's, it's just the way it is. So this does make me wonder to what extent these companies are American companies, if they are more responsive to the market incentives and to the regulations that come from China. We were just talking about them being torn between two different sets of rules, US laws versus Chinese laws and incentives. Um, at some point, they may have to make a choice. Um, and if, if China is the faster growing market, the bigger market, I mean, they certainly have more people. Um, would they choose China? Or at some point, should we say that, in fact, they really are, on the whole, driven by Chinese priorities and concerns, and in some sense, are not really American companies? Well, you know, 90% um, of global growth going forward is outside of America and Europe. You know, America is a, you know, is a tapped out country in many ways where we're comfortable and, and, and fully developed. Europe, uh, they don't have the growth. And if you're in business, you've got to go where the growth is. So, um, you know, as, as righteous as we may want to be that we don't like the Chinese system and things they're doing, and there's many things I don't like they're, what they're doing. Um, can you not not be there? That's the problem. No, nobody goes to China and say, boy, this is going to be a lot of fun. It's just you can't not be there. Um, you've got to be there. So what I, I mean, what I try to argue is, um, especially on uh, technology companies being in China and, you know, uh, especially with dual circulation, um, you know, being there because the Chinese government knows they have stuff that they want to learn or want to do or help with the Chinese building their own tech and their own economy is... Um, what I try to tell people is, uh, you look, there's nothing you can do about that. So um, you got to use China to beat China. You got to, you got to, you got to take the profits you make in China, and you got to use those at home uh, to develop your technology and stay ahead globally. Uh, Are the, companies doing that? Um, I think you're going to see more and more companies doing that because they don't want to be. They look, nobody wants to be beholden to China. There is not. You know, there's there's not a high public opinion among uh, among American business on 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 China on dealing with the Chinese government. They're scared of the Chinese government actually, um, and they're and they're frustrated, um, and and they know a charm offensive like they have now is a is an illusory thing. Um, so uh, um, uh, if you look at public opinion around the world um, uh, on China, despite uh, uh, President Trump pulling America out of international institutions, denigrating international institutions, um, uh, denigrating our um, um, allies. If you look at public opinion on uh, trust in America versus China, um, I think um, uh, China is about 30 percent and America is 60 some percent. Uh, company, countries still trust America more. Uh, America's got to get out in the world and compete. We got to get out in the world and compete. You know, we, we can't sit back and complain about China and the Belt and Road Initiative or, or China and what it's doing. Uh, we can't withdraw. I sometimes think we've been, we've been rich too long. You know, we, we, you know, of course, you know, Kathy, Fugo Sandai, you know, uh, mm -hmm. wealth doesn't make it past the third generation. Uh, we're too fat and happy. You know, of course, we're not all rich, but as a country, uh, we're pretty fat and happy. And we've, maybe we've, we've lost some of our edge. And maybe China's doing us a favor. This may, we should take this as a Sputnik moment to wake up and compete and, and, and not just, and, you know, we can be very righteous about the Chinese system and what they're doing, but they come back at us. And they look at, you know, school shootings, they look at uh, Black Lives Matter, you know, we're far from perfect. Uh, I'm not trying to do an equivalency, but we got to get off our righteousness sometime and, and fix ourselves. Mm. Okay, uh, I'm going to take another question here. How should U.S. companies that want to operate in and sell to China think more long term? You said that China currently feels vulnerable and wants to maintain the presence of foreign companies. Uh, what happens when the Chinese government feels more confident? So, in other words, as you was just suggesting, you know, this, this, this charm offensive may be ephemeral. So how should U.S. companies that are 
aware of that, that this is, you know, they're nice to me this year, they may be less nice to me in five years, how should they think more long term? Um, know clearly what they're, they're up to and outsmart them. Because if you're in the China market and you're doing things, you got to just stay ahead. You got to, you know, because Chinese companies, ex except for state-owned industries that are put under pressure, they want the best products. They want the best partners. They like working with foreign companies because they, they perform better. And you're not dealing with corruption. You're not dealing with um, a lot of the, a lot of the um, difficulties you have with local companies that are not as sophisticated. So you can compete in the China market through business performance, through quality of your products. Um, so, you know, be very clear. Uh, you know, I, I always, I used to tell companies, you got to find a comfortable place between uh, suicide and self-destruction. Um, uh, suicide is uh, continuing to do what you've always done and thinking and things haven't changed. Self-destruction is thinking that the government is so powerful. You got to hand over what you have to the Chinese government. You know, you got to, you got to, you got to look out for your business and you got to deal with the politics. Mm. Are Chinese, uh, are, sorry, are U.S. company CEOs concerned about China's use of hostage diplomacy, specifically the detention of Canadians in retaliation for the detention of Huawei's uh, chief financial officer? And what are they doing to protect themselves? Yes. Yes. Um, I've had, um, uh, back after, after Michael Kovrig and Spanos were uh, taken hostage, and that, that's what it was, um, the, uh, uh, I, I had um, clients in, in the United States calling me saying, can I come to China? Should I come to China? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, now, uh, you know, even this journalist, these Australian journalists who had to go hide in their embassy and consulate for a few days, and then get escorted out of the country out of fear. Um, this is um, this is a new chapter. Um, uh, yeah, people are people are concerned actually because um, um, hostage taking has not been something China did, and also blocking people from being able to leave um, because they're in some dispute um, is um, China's taken. Uh, China's really overstepped on that. Um, that second thing that you mentioned, I don't, I'm not sure that that's really widely known, that China will sometimes block, or certainly they will sometimes refuse permission for their own citizens to leave the country, um, but they will also sometimes block foreigners from leaving China uh, because they are engaged in a legal dispute, they've been accused of some kind of a, of a violation, or even sometimes simply owing money. In other words, it could be civil matter, it doesn't necessarily have to be a criminal matter, have you have you seen this um, increase in frequency? And do you have any sense of the numbers that we might be talking about? Um, no, I don't. But I talking to my friends who are in the risk business, you know, the, the security people, um, mm -hmm. it happens more than we know because they usually keep it very quiet. Um, and it, it happens. It often happens to ethnic Chinese who have a foreign passport. Mm. You're always part of the, um, are always part of the, uh, you know, China in China's government's mind, no matter what your passport is, if you're ethnic Chinese. But it also happens. It also happens to um, uh, non-Chinese, um, mm -hmm. and uh, that you know that I mean that was the, the the worry with the extradition law that started the, these demonstrations in Hong Kong is you can get pulled back where, you know, uh, and have a you can have a dispute in Wuhan where, you know, the uh, uh, a local politician that's got power can pull you back and, and uh, you know, there's no due process, whatever. Um, people are worried about that. Um, this, this was a, uh, you know, for, for um, the, the, for, uh, again, uh, Kovrig and Spanos were a real wake up call. Um, mm -hmm. Because that was a direct retaliation for the arrest of uh, Miss Mung in uh, Vancouver by the Canadians on behalf of the, the Americans. I have heard that there are some American companies that have instructed their top officials, you know, their C level people, and even down to some level, that they are not to go to China because of that. Um, is that your understanding as well? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know how widespread it is, but anecdotally, I've heard that. Um, and 
again, what happened with these journalists, you know, they're journalists, but so what? It was the same kind of a thing. It was tit for tat. Mm -hmm. uh, so what, ha what would happen if in October, if, um, you know, President Trump decided to help his reelection by, uh, you know, being harder on China and arresting a couple of Chinese executives in the U.S.? You know, what, what's China's reaction to be? People are very, people are concerned about that. Mm. A number of um, people are asking for your um, analysis of the TikTok affair. <laughs> and of course, the most recent developments are that it looks like Oracle is going to enter into some kind of an arrangement, details not clear yet, I think, uh, to, to um, to partner with TikTok as opposed to an actual uh, sale. Um, how do you see this transaction? And just my own comment, this is was not any of the questions, is it seems like this is a very unusual US government direct intervention, uh, a little bit beyond what CFIUS normally does. Uh, are there concerns that there will be more of these types of interventions? Well, you know, the background to this is um, cyber hacking out of China. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the OPM, where they got, what, how much, 21 million records of American employees? O or, OPM. OPM, yeah. Um, and, Which stands uh, for the uh, Office of Personnel Management. The hack uh, that took place one or two years ago, correct? It was longer ago than that, but they, mm -hmm. it was also the security clearance documents for um, American officials. It made everybody vulnerable in the American government whose records were taken. It was a lot. It was millions. I forget how many actually. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of a thing um, has laid the groundwork for complete distrust of the Chinese government on, mm -hmm. on anything to do with data. I mean, that's actually what's behind Huawei also. It's, it's, it's this distrust. So, I mean, I know when they were bidding, when the Chinese company was bidding for the subway cars in Washington, D.C. Metro, uh, there was pushback because they could be uh, listening to what people say on the Metro and uh, bringing that back to the Communist Party headquarters. That's kind of the extremes it went to. So what's really unusual about TikTok is Jiang Yimin, the founder, is a very, very decent, sophisticated guy. He had a short video service called Duoin in China that was rocking and rolling, and he wanted to do it internationally, but he didn't want to get Huawei. So he did a separate company, uh, a separate, um, whole separate system, um, and um, it took off like crazy. Um, and then, um, and then all of a sudden, uh, then the U.S. goes after it because it's wait a second, um, you know, we we cannot let the Communist Party see dance videos of our of our of our of our people um, dancing around the world. That would be a, a a very dangerous thing. But it basically what this is, even though he tried to construct something that would be palatable internationally or to America, he got whacked for it. What this tells me. Chinese entrepreneurs are not going to be able to build any global companies. They're going to be trapped inside of China because of, of distrust of the Chinese government. Hmm. Uh, this guy tried to do it right. Well, then we have an unusual president who decides he's going to go after this um, on the, the data thing, and he's going to make some money off it for the U.S. Treasury at the same time. This is, you know, this, the way it was done is just a, a, a crazy kind of, uh, of one-off. And so now, actually, it seems like it's pretty practical with uh, Larry Ellison, a supporter of, of the president, uh, getting, uh, getting Oracle uh, in on the deal, and that the algorithms will stay in China, the data will be stored here, and people can still dance, I guess, that'll how, how it'll work. Mm. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it, it's akin to um, uh, going back to when uh, China decided to block Google and Facebook and um, you know, everybody else. Um, it's, it's basically, it's the core is distrust. This is a messy, dumb deal. But um, um, I think TikTok will survive in a hybrid, strange um, formula. Um, uh, we'll have to see where this goes in the future. But I do, I do very much worry about Chinese entrepreneurs um, being able, being unable to go global, or at least to go to America. And so what actually, if you look at Alibaba and some of these people are doing, they're investing very heavily in Southeast Asia um, and elsewhere. They were investing very heavily in, in India. 
I remember being told that um, what uh, what something like 60 of the top 100 apps on Indian phones were Chinese uh, two years ago, and now they're all blocked. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, China's also through its um, uh, well, I think partly through its uh, um, really uh, dangerous border dispute with India has turned India against China. Um, again, the Chinese government's going to have to decide if it wants its companies to go global, it's going to have to um, repair its reputation and behavior around the world and the way it's viewed. Have you heard anything about what the solution is going to be for WeChat? And I think this is a question that certainly for me and probably many of the people on this call is actually more important than than bite dance and then um, I haven't made any dance videos lately, but I use WeChat on a daily basis in order to follow what is happening in China. And uh, in particular, there are certain um, public channels that I follow that offer uh, developments in Chinese law. And it's um, useful for me, of course, for many Chinese Americans and Chinese who are living and studying and working in the US, it's the main way that they communicate with their families. Have you heard anything about a solution for the executive order against them? You know, these executive orders come out of the White House um, without a lot of expertise or thought in them, and they land in the Commerce Department. And, and all right, Commerce, do something with this. Yeah. Come up with implementing regulations. And Commerce is tearing their hair out, yeah. especially with WeChat, because American businesses can't do without WeChat in China. You know, not only for communications with their customers and their staff and their suppliers, but a lot of their sales happen through WeChat. WeChat is the Swiss army knife of, of, of internet applications. It does everything. Um, and also, as you talk about communications outside. Last I heard from friends in commerce is they are struggling to, to come up with some mitigating strategies. Um, whether, and what that means is maybe trying to mitigate um, state news propaganda going outside of China through WeChat mm -hmm. and, and, and giving people um, um, distorted information, uh, things like that. Um, I think WeChat, they bit off a lot more than they can chew and they don't know what the heck to do with it. Um, but I, I'm, I'm pretty confident that it's not going to be blocked to Americans and American companies in China. Um, it may be somewhat truncated. Uh, in the United States. I don't know exactly how you do that. There was some talk of just not allowing updates mm -hmm. uh, uh, to the app, which, you know, will, will eventually make it dissipate. But, um, uh, you know, I, when I'm in China, I live on WeChat. That's how I talk to my kids is, is WeChat. And that's how I uh, get a car. It's how I get food. It's, you know, it's... it's yeah, how you pay for a cab and so on. And yeah. I also haven't done any dance videos lately, so I'm not worried about TikTok. Right. Well, there's two aspects here. So you just mentioned in connection with WeChat, this concern about information coming out of China, you know, propaganda, the idea of, of, of using WeChat and other apps like TikTok as a propaganda channel, um, using the algorithms to push certain information up in, into viewers' uh, view, and then other information can be pushed down. That's one set of concerns that U.S. Uh, regulators and, and, and people in the public and have, have focused on. Another set is the data harvesting aspect. And so those two pieces just happen to be uh, issues that we are already concerned about with respect to domestic American apps and, and domestic um, companies, including Google and, and Microsoft and so on. So would the ideal solution for these Chinese companies and even Huawei be to have some uh, neutral, country neutral set of regulations that address algorithms, that address uh, how information is pushed up and pushed down, that address uh, misinformation, and also uh, privacy, harvesting of data, and so on, towards all apps and all data companies, irrespective of their nationality. Would that be a, an alternative way of, of dealing with these companies and with the risks that they pose? Um, that would be somewhat possible between the US and Europe, maybe. Mm -hmm. you, I mean, you have to have kind of the same DNA in your political system in the way you look at things um, in order for that to happen. I mean, we have a hard enough time trying to do it domestically 
Uh, you know, I mean, look at what are we doing about Russian hacking of the upcoming election, right? Uh, it doesn't look like we're doing a lot. Um, so yeah, this, uh, you know, the social media has changed the world and we don't know how to deal with it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's changed, you know, you and I are both, uh, um, you know, journalists from a prehistoric age when, you know, there was editors and there was uh, deadlines and there was a newspaper and there was, well, when I was a kid, three evening news. Now there's just so much, um, uh, everything rolling around and, and so much disinformation. You know, China no longer has a, a monopoly on, or Russia on a disinformation. We're pretty damn good at it domestically here. So I don't, I do not have any any solutions for this. I have no idea where it's going to go, but um, it's very damaging for politics and societies, and um, and could be damaging for economies as we go forward. This also makes me think of uh, what we were talking about before when you were you were saying there was a need for a new relationship between business and government, um, some kind of a new partnership to uh, strengthen the domestic economy here. Uh, jobs training programs and that kind of thing um, in order to address the regulation of information and the challenges posed by the digital economy we also need new ways of partnering new ways of thinking about what is business's own realm what does business get to decide what does government get to decide do they decide together if so how do they decide together I mean this it all kind of comes back to this almost fundamental question about what is the relationship between business and government in our system. And China all along, it's been very clear <laughs> who's in charge, right? Government is in charge, business follows along. Chinese government recognizes that business brings a lot to the table, that they have strengths, that they have skills that the government doesn't have. They, they, I think they realize that. But at the end of the day, they decide, this is a, perhaps an unfair question because it's not, it's, it's, you know, you don't, you don't spend your days uh, meditating on the future of, uh, you know, business government relationships, but what might it look like or what might be some steps toward reopening, a, you know, a conversation or thinking about the, the, the forms in which business, government, and for that matter, the public, because I think the public needs to be involved in that. It shouldn't be a closed door you know, cigar filled room conversation, but in which we talk about what those relationships are, whether it's a business decision to close a factory in, you know, in, in Iowa and send the jobs to China, or whether it's a business decision to start doing the R&D in China and not do it in the United States so that thereafter all of that R&D is located offshore, or whether it's the decision to Re re regulate algorithms and how AI operates and how much data gets harvested and what happens to the data. These are all questions that go to do we the public and does the government as our representative get to tell business what to do to some how to what extent do they get to tell them and to what extent does business get to say my profit this quarter or my profit next year requires me to partner with China. Um, well, in, 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 in one way, I think China's done us a big favor. I think Ch China, by, um, uh, wake, by um, waking us up um, and, and uh, competing so strongly w with their own system, I don't think it's about business or government who makes a decision. I think business and government have to come together and what's good for the country. You know, what, is it, what is good for the country? We now have um, an authoritarian capitalism that we have to face. And it has great strengths in many ways. It's got weaknesses, but it, it, in certain time and place, it's got strengths. Because when Chinese companies like Huawei can go around the world, Huawei is a very smart, capable company. Um, I, I will give them that. And it's a very innovative company. But they also can go around the world and they can bid for, for uh, telecom contracts and they can underbid everybody else by 40, 50% or give it away because they have $30 billion line of credit from State Development Bank and God knows what their real ownership is. Um, and so how do you compete against that? Um, we need to step back and have American business and American government work together on what's good for the country. Uh, we, you know, this is the larger conversation that on America rethinking a lot of things right now. And, 
you know, China right now is using what the trade tariffs and the hostility from the, around the world as a Sputnik moment to take care of themselves with this dual circulation and focus on what's, you know, every aspect of what they do, what is good for China and how do we deal in a hostile world? Well, America should do the same damn thing. This should be a Sputnik moment for us to compete because our system has incredible strengths. It's got incredible strengths and we are dissipating our, I've watched China overcome its weaknesses for 30 years and I've been watching America dissipate our strengths. Um, you know, look at right now, what are we, what are we doing on, on, um, on foreign talent coming into the US? What are we doing on immigration? You know, what are we doing on, um, on, on, on um, um, keeping people here once, once they're educated here? Um, mm -hmm. We need to take care of all of this. Um, and we can, but we're fat and happy. We got to wake up and compete. Mm. I have a question here um, about the closing of the consulates, the tit for tat consulate closings. Um, we closed the Chinese consulate in Houston. They closed the Chinese consulate in Chengdu, which I think was one of the very first, I'm sorry, the US consulate in Chengdu, which I think was one of the very first consulates that the United States had. Um, in China. Um, and of course, uh, the United States also shut down the Fulbright program in China. And before that, they shut down the Peace Corps program in China. Is this an own goal? Yes. Or does it serve a useful purpose? Yes, it's, it's an own goal. It's completely useless. Mm -hmm. if, if, you know, they said that the Houston concert was a nest of spies. Uh, you know, okay, if they're a nest of spies, then go do something about the spies there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that don't, you don't close it down. I mean, you know, you close down Chengdu, you, you eliminate uh, the U.S. presence for, you know, basically, uh, you know, the, this would be the closest consulate is the difference between uh, Chicago and San Diego. You know, now the closest consulate is that, that far away in China. And um, these consulates serve a very good purpose. They, they, they do a lot locally uh, if for nothing else but visas and, and uh, for Chinese people. Uh, cultural programs. It is a s complete own goal. And now, you know, the, the tragedy is we have all these very decent Chinese people who have been working at that consulate uh, for many years. They're now out on the streets and nobody will hire them. Uh, you know, they're tainted because they worked for the Americans. Um, oh, you're talking about Chinese who worked at the Chengdu consulate? Yes. Um, when actually the same thing is happening with the journalists and all their news assistants that were working for the news bureaus where the journalists have been kicked out, um, state security is going to them and saying, you can't work here, going to their parents. Mm -hmm. uh, just we're eroding all these institutions. Are U.S. companies' operations in China having difficulty recruiting Chinese? Because of, as you mentioned before, even at the senior management level, uh, country president level, many of them are actually Chinese citizens, and certainly beneath that, they mostly are. Is recruitment and re retention of Chinese employees a problem now? Yeah, it's starting. Actually, the survey, uh, the, the AmCham, uh, Shanghai AmCham survey showed that, mm -hmm. that um, uh, you know, they're starting to see um, uh, less, less luster in working for American companies, and they're having a harder time recruiting. Um, and this is, uh, you know, the, working for an American company was, uh, uh, people liked working for American companies because they were treated fairly and they had opportunities in training and, uh, uh, you know, uh, non, mostly non-political Chinese culture, um, um, corporate culture. Um, and now if we're making it, uh, you know, uh, uh, not a great place to work politically, mm -hmm. uh, what, what a mess. Mm -hmm. One, uh, one person is asking about how does the United States incentivize U.S. companies to do the kinds of things that you've been recommending them to do? So how do we change the incentive mixture um, so that U.S. companies do what you're suggesting because, of course, they're not already doing it? Well, um, the, uh, I think it takes leadership in government. Um, you know, let's just look at President Trump. Um, I'm not a fan at all, but he scared the American business community stiff through tweets. 
every CEO in America was scared of getting tweeted against and watching yeah. their stock drop. Um, so if uh, uh, that's a uh, that's a different kind of bully pulpit. But yeah. American government leadership, working company, the people that run these companies are are um, patriotic. Many of them are immigrants, um, and they they yeah. care about the United States. Their families in the United States. Their homes are in the United States, and they want the United States to do well. So I think through you know just patriotic actions and working together on, on, um, on moving the country ahead. It, it just takes government leadership. It needs our political system. We got to fix our political system and quit yelling at each other on cable TV. I know I pontificate a lot and I'm sorry about that, but I've, I've lived offshore for 30 years and I'm patriotic. And to, to watch how silly we've become back here is, um, is disheartening. Hmm. question about the trade deal. We had phase one of a trade deal um, agreed many months ago before COVID, uh, right on the cusp of COVID. Um, there's been some speculation that uh, Trump is going to pull out of the phase one deal as another kind of, um, you know, as a, as a way of showing strength against China prior to the election. Uh, what would this what would this actually mean? I'm not going to ask you to speculate on the prospects of, of, of that happening unless you desire to, <laughs> but, but if, if, if he did, what, what would that mean? Has the trade deal, to what extent has the trade deal actually been put into force? Because everybody's been distracted by COVID, a lot of business on both sides has been, has, has powered down. Um, has it, has it been implemented and what would it mean to cancel it? Actually, the phase one trade deal, the Chinese have worked very hard to implement it um, mm -hmm. on openings to agriculture and standards. And there was a lot of detailed stuff in there that they have adhered to. On, on the purchases, China is way behind, but the purchases were never realistic. Those trade negotiators would have told you the day it was signed that those numbers were put in to make President Trump happy. Nobody looked at them as being anywhere near possible you know, 200 billion extra um, over two years, that's uh, impossible. They're just, the goods aren't there and the demand is not there. Um, the, and, and the phase one addresses none of the real um, technology, force tech transfer, IP, whatever, the difficult issues, but they wanted to, both sides wanted to sign something to bring, um, to bring the boil down. So, um, it's the only thin thread we've got going between the two countries right now. If that breaks, um, you know, uh, Lighthizer and Leo He are the only people talking to each other, you know, with Mnuchin and a few others every now and then. Um, you know, we used to, I, I was one of the people who complained about the Joint Commission on Commerce and Trade and the strategic and economic dialogue, the hundred dialogues we had with China. I was actually a participant in the CEO dialogue for the strategic and economic dialogue. And I could see that everybody's going through the motions. I forget what year it was, 2016 or something like that. The, um, they became dialogues to nowhere. And um, um, you know, I, was, um, I and many others were advocate for changing them, revitalizing them and making them more useful. But instead we just killed them all and we got no dialogue now other than phase one. So if we kill phase one, you can't break that thin thread because it's not a, it's not a a complicated or a damaging one. And as far as the numbers go on purchases, they were impossible to begin with. You know, I, I, I got to defend China on that one. Mm. Just, I'm not sure if everybody on the call will be familiar with these dialogues that you're talking about. So just to sort of fill in that picture, as of, you know, five, 10 years ago, uh, you, you mentioned what, 100? Um, I heard there was several hundred actually, but each department of the uh, U.S. government seemed to have its own dialogue series with their counterparts in China, um, which might have been annual, they might have been quarterly, some of them were more frequent, some of them were less frequent. Um, and you say a lot of them were, were empty, but they, they did have the benefit of putting working level people in conversation with each other. In other words, not just everything being about symmetry, but people at the working level getting to know their opposite numbers at the, at the working level. Um, and, and now if they're entirely shut down, then if one side has a question to ask the other, do they even know whom to ask? 
No, and I tell you what it does, it leads to a lot of distrust and suspicion on both sides once you, you lose that discussion. You know, I was mostly critical of the Joint Commission on Commerce and Trade because it was, it was about these um, business issues every year and um, they would talk about the same things every year and, and promises would be made, but they, were not, they wouldn't be held. You know, Matt Pottinger, um, the Deputy National Security Advisor, he keeps a 10 page um, uh, single space, 10 page bullet point document on his desk. Um, and this is a list of all the things China agreed to and didn't carry out. Yeah. Uh, uh, and that, that, you know, that kind of defines it, that these things were keeping the um, bureaucrats busy, but not uh, affecting much. But uh, you're right, Kathy, on the other side, if people aren't talking to each other, distrust and, and suspicion um, and emotions build up, and that's not going to lead to anything good. Well, we've seen this uh, in, you know, in the world that I live in, which is of civil society, uh, universities, education, nonprofits, the exchanges have dramatically reduced. And the result is that we, we just, there's, there's more and more that we don't know. Yes. When we... and, and, and you don't know, and then you conjure up ideas that might, might be wrong. And right. lead to, I'm, yeah, I'm very, I'm very concerned about the U.S.-China relationship. Whether we like uh, China or not, um, uh, we better figure out how to, and China may not like America. Um, you know, uh, the, we got, and this is a bad marriage with too many kids to split up. <laughs> well, with that memorable uh, message, <laughs> that metaphor in mind, Jim, we're going to have to leave it here. Thank you so much for spending time with us. This has been a very illuminating uh, talk. And uh, we, uh, I wish you luck in getting back to China. Uh, and um, look forward to hearing more details from you in future of what we should actually do uh, to solve this dilemma that we're in. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kathy. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.